when we talk about weather, the things that come to mind are clouds, precipitation, and possibly humidity. And humidity is what is the m amount of water in the air, and it's that feeling when you go outside that it, you're just sticky. Or if you spend a lot of time doing your hair only to go outside and then it starts to frizz up. That's we, Humidity is what we have to blame for that. Um, saturated air is when the air can no longer hold any more water vapor. So if air is said to be saturated, it um, is at its max um, water vapor point. We know that warm air can hold uh, more water than cold air um, due to the fact that it is less dense and the uh, there's more um, space in between all of the molecules. Relative humidity we express in a percentage. We talk about the humidity today is 72 percent and what that means is we're taking a look at the amount of water vapor in the air compared to the amount of water vapor the air can actually hold. Two ways that we can change or relative humidity or two ways that the humidity level changes is by the addition or um, removal of water vapor from the air. So uh, ways that we add water vapor to the air is through evaporation and transpiration. Ways that we remove water vapor from the air is when, uh, when it rains or we have some other form of precipitation falling from the sky. The second way that relative humidity can change is uh, by the changing of temperature. If the temperature lowers, then it, that just increases the relative humidity. If the temperature increases, then it just decreases the relative humidity because we know that the warm air can hold more water vapor. So if temperature increases and the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere um, stays the same, well, the relative humidity just decreased because the amount of water vapor in the air compared to how much the air can actually hold now just got lowered. Two ways that we measure humidity is by using either a hair hygrometer or a sling psychrometer. In class, we are going to um, try to use uh, sling psychrometers to measure the relative humidity both in the classroom and outside. This is going to use two different bulbs, one dry, one wet, and you sling them down around in a circle um, like manner and then look at the difference in temperature between the two. The closer the temperature is to one another, the higher the humidity is in the air. Dew point then is the temperature that the air has to be cooled to in order to reach saturation. Um, when that happens, we will experience things like fog and clouds. High dew point temperatures mean we have moist air. Low dew point temperatures mean we have dry air. Um, if the dew point is at or at near the surface temperature, then you can go expect when you go outside for it to be extremely humid, um, there to be uh, either fog in uh, close to the ground or a lot of clouds in the sky. Ways that we get clouds is because the air lifts. Four ways that, um, or four reasons that we have lifting air is either orographic lifting or um, when we are near mountain ranges, the airflow cannot go through a mountain, so therefore it must go up. When the air goes up the mountain, we call it orographic lifting. The air is then going to um, condense as it cools giving us the formation of clouds. The second process that causes air to lift is frontal wedging. When two fronts um, come together or one is overtaking another, the warm air is going to rise above the cool air. Same thing, air will then cool, um, allowing the water vapor to condense, giving us clouds and then precipitation. The last two, convergence, also dealing with two air masses, which we'll talk about air masses and fronts um, in your next module. But with convergence, two air masses meet, they're converging um, or coming together. And then when that happens, it's going to cause the air to rise up because it has nowhere else to go. And then localized lifting. If you we have an area uh, like a parking lot where there's a lot of asphalt. That asphalt is going to heat up very quickly causing these warm pockets of air to rise. When that air rises it will then form clouds. The two conditions that we need for clouds to form is the air has to be saturated meaning there needs to be enough water in the air or the air um, has cooled to its dew point and also there has to be a condensation nuclei. There needs to be something for the water to condense on and in our case in the atmosphere our water condenses on dust. The three different main types of clouds are cirrus clouds, stratus, and cumulus. 
Cirrus clouds are those high, thin, wispy clouds. They are um, made of ice. Uh, when we see them, we know that a front is approaching us. Cumulus clouds are those puffy clouds that uh, often look like various um, shapes. Uh, when they we have low um, white fluffy clouds or cumulus clouds, we know that it's going to be fair weather. Um, when these cloud, when the cumulus clouds become larger, they get darker in color, um, turn to gray. That is when we are going to experience our thunderstorms. Also, with um, we know thunderstorms are coming because the cloud, the cumulus clouds have a lot of vertical development. They are not only um, big in size um, horizontally, but they are vertically develop extremely high as well. And then stratus clouds are in between the two. Um, they have this layered look. They are um, sheet look sheets of clouds, and we know. Um, Stratus clouds mean steady rain. Um, it's going to lead to overcast uh, conditions in the sky. Nimbus, you may have heard before um, when we talk about cumulonimbus clouds. Those are the thunderstorm um, clouds. They're dark gray in color. They are extremely tall. When you see them, you know that um, storms are coming. And then when we t also talk about our types of clouds, we also then have to talk about the heights at which they develop. If a cloud develops at a very high altitude, we put Ciro in front of the name. Um, Ciro, um, again, icy, smaller, thinner clouds. Um, if the clouds are developing at a mid latitude, we put Elto in front of the name. So a um, Elto stratus cloud, for example, medium sized cloud. And then our low clouds are. Um, much larger in size. Again, most of our lower clouds a lot of times will be our um, cumulus clouds. When we get clouds, um, most of the time, but not all clouds then lead to some form of precipitation. And hopefully by now you know that uh, precipitation is just any water that falls from a cloud. We know that um, water vapor only makes up um, less than 4% of the volume of air in our atmosphere and that precipitation falls in one of three states of matter or we see it in one of three states of matter in the atmosphere either as a solid liquid or as a gas. The six types of precipitation here you can see all of these and the temperatures are needed for them to form so when it is um, colder than five degrees Celsius that's when we will experience snow. Um, if the temperature is between negative five and five degrees Celsius it, the, we will experience snow but it's going to be a um, heavy wet snow. The snow that um, now down here I'm, there's not a whole lot of shoveling that goes on but it's the kind of snow that you do not want to have to shovel. Um, if the temperatures are greater than five degrees Celsius the precipitation is going to stay a liquid and we're just going to experience rain. If rain freezes as it falls we call it sleet. If rain freezes when it impacts earth or an object on earth we uh, call that freezing rain. And then hail is the chunks of ice that fall from the sky that create the most damage um, to cars, um, your house, things like that. 